Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Suzanne Simon with Restore America's Estuaries. I'm the program director for the Coastal Watersheds Grants. I'm joined today by our communications lead, Rob Shane, who will be helping me field questions. So you will hear his voice from time to time as well. The request for proposals, along with other information, is available on the Ray website, which is www.estuaries.org. Before we get going on the content, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Everyone is on mute. If you have a question or comment, please submit it via the Q&A or chat functions. If we do not address your comment or question in real time during the webinar, please email me or make an appointment with me to touch base, and I'll describe on how to do that later in this webinar. This webinar is the second of two and is being recorded, and we will post the better of the two to Ray's YouTube channel and website. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we will be covering today, we'll be doing an overview of the NEP Coastal Watersheds Grant Program, uh, eligibility, the funding of available, budget and match, and the application process and deadlines. Before we get into the details on that, a quick overview as to Restore, Restore America's Estuaries. We are a national organization dedicated to the protection and restoration of bays and estuaries as essential resources for our nation. You can see our 10 member groups there on the map and our affiliate members down below at the bottom. If you would like to become an affiliate member, there's a lot of great benefits. I highly recommend that you check out our website. Some other resources and opportunities that you might be interested in. Um, Restore America's Estuaries also has some other funding opportunities. For those of you in Southeast New England, this would be mostly uh, the Cape and Islands and Rhode Island. Um, the Southeast New England Watershed Implementation Grants, they are accepting applications right now. So for those of you in that geography, take a look at that. Uh, we also have Caring for Our Coast, which is down in the Gulf of Mexico, and the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund, they just closed. Um, however, I bring these to your attention for future reference <clears throat> as they happen on a regular basis. Some in-person events, we have the Living Shorelines Tech Transfer Workshop down in Galveston in October. We have our big biennial summit, which will be in October 24, uh, excuse me, October of 2024 in the DC metro area. National Estuaries Week, that happens wherever you are, but September uh, annually, and you can look at our website to find out more information as to how to get involved. In terms of some other resources, we also have our Coastal Restoration Toolkit. Um, we also have a DEIJ um, efforts, which we, which we wrap up into our Inclusive Coast Initiative. Um, and these are just a couple of things I just wanted to bring to your attention. So please check out our website for more information. Okay, a program overview of, the, you'll hear me say the NEP Coastal Watersheds Program. The NEP portion stands for National Estuary Program, which is a place-based program within the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, I'll also call that the EPA, with the goal to protect and restore the water quality and ecological integrity of estuaries of national significance. 28 estuaries located along the Atlantic, Gulf, Pacific coasts, and in Puerto Rico are designated as estuaries of national significance. EPA has a great website that provides more details on this program, and I encourage folks to learn about it by checking it out. The Coastal Watersheds Grant Program in particular was established by Congress as a competitive fund designed to help areas, to help coastal areas uh, address urgent and challenging issues. Restore America's Estuaries administers the program in coordination with and funding from EPA. So this is the fourth and final round of this particular funding mechanism. Now, some of you are who are on our web, or excuse me, on our email list will note that we had another funding opportunity come up in uh, February that is very similar in a lot of ways, but also has some key differences. So the geographic eligibility is slightly different between the two. Um, the funding totals, that is what the per project uh, cost can be is different and the project length is different. And I'll go over the details um, of this particular opportunity later in this webinar. I just want to make sure that folks are aware that there are, there have been sort of dueling RFPs out there and we recognize that there may be some questions about that. 
Okay, diving into the geographic eligibility for this grant. So um, the areas here in the tan or orange or however it shows up for you, um, these are the geographic eligibility areas. There is a link in the RFP uh, where it's an interactive map. You can really zoom in and find out how to you know, use it and find out where these areas are that are eligible. The brief description is that these areas encompass the existing 28 NEPs, that is the National Estuary Program Study Areas, plus some additional upstream and or downstream portions. These are designated by EPA, so there is no wiggle room. Uh, adjacent upstream or downstream areas will not be eligible. So in other words, anything on the ground, any project you're proposing has to occur within these polygons. These polygons reflect what is known as the HUC-12s, those are hydrologic, hydrologic unit codes, um, and explains why some of them might have some unexpected boundaries. Um, again, they're following the, the HUC codes. All right, so for an example, would a project on the Columbia River be eligible? So to get some orientation here, here's Portland, Oregon, Vancouver, Washington, here's a Columbia River. So uh, the answer is it depends. And the downstream reaches here in this orangey brown tan, yes, that would be eligible. Upstream up here in the Columbia, uh, the answer is no. So we fully recognize that the downstream areas would benefit from the upstream areas, but all the on the ground activities must occur within these shaded areas. As a point of note, though, if you are working with partners, let's say in a lab um, to, to run to process samples, that lab can be outside of the polygons, but all the on the ground activities or the impacted water bodies have to be within these shaded areas. Okay, next eligibility in terms of entities. So all of this information is in the RFP. So I highly encourage you to check it out if you want a deeper dive. This webinar is meant to be sort of a higher level overview. So uh, in terms of entities, you have public organizations. This would be state, county, local, regional, interstate consortia, things like that, nonprofit organizations. Um, these organizations must be able to demonstrate their nonprofit, their 501c3 status, academic institutions, are eligible as our tribes and indigenous communities. Um, For-profit organizations and federal agencies may be on a team, but not as the applicant. And I'll, I'll phrase that again. For-profit organizations and federal agencies, they can receive funding, but they have to partner with one of these other eligible entities as the applicant. And for the definition that we use as team member for the purposes of this RFP, is it is an individual and organization that will receive funds or will be providing match and are listed as such in the budget. NEPs are also eligible entities to be very clear because they fall under that either the public or the nonprofit um, designation. Uh, folks can partner with a local NEP, that's also allowed. Okay, moving on. So in terms of the types of projects, um, I'm going to go over what's not allowed, followed by their project requirements. Again, please check the RFP. There is a laundry list of the types of projects that, that are encouraged. Um, so what's not allowed? Um, research for research sake. Um, all, any research that is done as part of a project, it has to be actionable. And it needs to, if it's going to be funded, um, lead directly to improvements in estuarine conditions. Um, and so, so another way to think about this is ivory tower versus applied. Sometimes that's another way folks can think about it. Again, research so long as, as it has actionable consequences and improvements in estuarine conditions, um, they are allowed. Uh, similarly, standalone outreach and education is not allowed. We do want to see outreach and education as part of a project, but if a project is solely outreach and education, that is not permitted. Um, also monitoring, routine monitoring. Again, if, if a project is solely that marine mo routine monitoring, it is not allowed. However, monitoring, for example, if you're doing baseline and then some post-project monitoring, that's fine because it will result or help inform on the ground activities and adaptive management. 
Land acquisition may not be funded uh, using federal funds, although it may be used to satisfy the non-federal match requirements. Also, social surveys, questionnaires, and similar efforts, those cannot be funded. Uh, it runs afoul of, of some other federal regulations. Similarly, activities required as part of legal settlements, mitigation, anything that, that is required, and that also extends to NERDA, which is a Natural Resources um, Damages Act, and also restoration. Uh, they, those activities, you can't use these funds to to, to to do any efforts that are required as part of settlements, um, nor can NERDA funds be used as match. Um, also noted here, maximum of three proposals per entity. Um, and then one thing that we do get a question on on a regular basis is planning and feasibility. Are those allowed? The answer is yes. Um, so long as the applicant demonstrates a clear connection between the proposed efforts and improved coastal and estuarine conditions. So again, hopefully that's becoming very clear that there needs to be that explicit tie between what is being proposed and what will ultimately happen in terms of improvements. So I realize I'm kind of blasting through a lot of these. If you have questions, please get in touch as I'm happy to help. I fully understand that that there are definitely some nuances and gray areas in some of these cases. So just get in touch and I'm happy to help as I can. Okay, um, I'll go through the project requirements and then we'll pause for any questions or comments. So the 2023 project requirements, they must, uh, any proposed effort must address one or more actions in a comprehensive conservation and management plan or similar state um, a state document. So there's a list of the CCMPs on the EPA website. And so make sure when you're developing your materials that you really explicitly say, you know, effort XYZ is going to address the priority actions one, two, and three. So make sure those are crystal clear. That is part of the congressional language that created this, that it has to be, there has to be that tie. Projects must be one to two years in length and fully completed by September of 2025. It must result in uh, environmental results. In other words, um, it's going to lead to improvements in those estuarine and coastal conditions. And address one or more of the four priorities for this particular request for proposal. For this year, they are recurring harmful algal blooms, flooding and coastal erosion, impacts of nutrients and warmer water temperatures, and contaminants of emerging concerns. So I realized that was a little bit like uh, drinking from a fire hose. So I'm going to pause there. And Rob, what questions do we have coming in? Sure, so we have a question from Matthew. Uh, Matthew writes, for monitoring that must result in on the ground activities, must the activities be predefined? For example, monitoring to identify and confirm the source of contamination in an estuary so that it can be fixed or addressed after the fact. I think we I think the answer is yes. I need to see the individual specifics of the proposed project. But again, I think since there will be a, a fairly uh, straightforward link between the two, then uh, I think, again, pending actual details, the answer is yes. OK, great. Um, and a question from Alberto um, on the clarification of the uh, definition of entity. So in this instance, is um, a specific university the entity or would the individual departments within the college or the university count as an entity, uh, it, assuming it, that multiple yeah. departments might apply for separate projects. Right. So generally, it is a university as a whole. We've defined this in the RFP a bit. Um, and so it's the university as a whole. OK, great. That's uh, that's all I've got for now. OK. One minute. All right. Moving on. Funding a number of awards. 
So we have approximately $1 million to be awarded in this round. And the per project cost is 75,000 to 250,000. So if you do the math, we'll be giving away, giving away granting for to approximately four to 10 awards, depending on how all of the, the numbers work out. Okay, budget and match. Again, all there's a lot more detail in the RFP. Um, I'll go over some of the highlights here. So please follow the format and details in the RFP, particularly with respect to the categories. Now, these are federal budget categories. Um, and so it's really important that, that, that the budgets as presented line up um, with those cost categories. Um, one of the other big things that... Uh, we need to be aware of is there is a non-federal match requirement of 33%. For example, if you are going to be requesting federal funding to the tune of 100,000, the approximate required non-federal match is 33,000 for a total match of 133,000. Um, we recognize that mat this non-federal match can be challenging. So we encourage folks to be um, legally creative, right? So um, sometimes folks have a tendency to, they might overlook some sources of match. So really think through, you know, what your partners and your team members are bringing to the table in terms of volunteer hours, in-kind contributions, that could be lab space, it could be boat use. Um, all of those things definitely add up. Um, one other thing is that match must occur and be expended during the um, during the time period, the award time period. So, for example, a land purchase from two years prior to the signing of the award documents, that would not be eligible. Um, similar to what's not allowed, may, match may not be from settlements, mitigation, et cetera, nor can most NIFWF funds be used for match. There's a couple of exceptions to that, but um, please check the RFP for that. Um, and last, but certainly not least, and this is an important um, issue, is we recognize that this non-federal match can be a barrier to application and, and folks even thinking about whether they even want to go through the effort, um, is we have instituted a waiver from the non-federal match requirement. Uh, note that requesting a waiver will not impact how a proposal is reviewed, nor will a waiver automatically be granted. Um, so see the RFP for additional information. Okay, so process and timeline. We have a two-step process. Uh, we call it a letter of intent. Some other programs you might have heard it called a pre-proposal followed by a full proposal if invited. Um, and we've kept this based on the feedback that we've gotten and also with the goal of um, making and keeping the process efficient and also, again, um, hopefully lowering the barriers to application, particularly for smaller organizations that may not have a robust grant writing staff. So uh, use the online submittal form. There'll be a link from the 2023 web page. Uh, we're gonna be going live a little bit later this week. So uh, stay tuned on that front. Um, this is in the RFP, but we strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you develop all your materials in a separate document and then make sure you have everything, you know, where you want it to be. And then you use the form. So just, Keep that in mind. Keep word limits in mind. Uh, that's all outlined in the RFP. Timeline, this first stage is due on May 5th. Um, and then you can see there the rest of the, the dates um, with the award process occurring in fall of 2023. The evaluation frameworks and scoring are shown in the RFP. Um, we are doing our best to be as transparent as we can. Um, and last but not least, and this is super important, you need to get a letter of acknowledgement from your local or nearest National Estuary Program. Please reach out sooner than later. It's the responsibility of the applicant to reach these deadlines. Um, there is a list of the NEP contacts on the EP EPA's National Estuary Program webpage. There's also a link in the RFP. So um, definitely make sure that, that you reach out sooner than later. Uh, it looks like we had a question come in, Rob. Yes. Um, so one of the attendees is asking, are they allowed to submit the same project request that they applied for the watersheds grant uh, 
uh, program, the other, the other NEP grant program that Ray administers, uh, given that they won't know the uh, success of their prior application before the deadline for this grant program? Great question. So um, per the timeline of the other program, um, assuming everything goes according to plan, um, the the status of the LOIs will be going out on this Friday. So that would be the 24th. And we timed it that way. So that way, if folks didn't necessarily get invited to do um, a full proposal submittal, they would still have the ability to submit an, um, an LOI for, for this particular funding opportunity. Um, the one thing I will note, um, and I mentioned earlier in the webinar that um, you know, the total project sizes are different and things like that. So um, these projects are 75,000 to 250,000 and up to two years in length. So if your project that you submitted for the other one falls in that category, then that's pretty straightforward. Um, however, the other funding opportunity, those were 200 to 500,000 and up to four years in length. So it's entirely possible that, you know, what what was being um, proposed in the previous, uh, wrap, you know, the previous opportunity earlier this year, it, it might be possible, but just keep in mind that, um, you know, in all likelihood, there might be some differences to the the project details to keep that in mind when you're, if, if you're going to go ahead and, and submit for this opportunity as well. Okay, some other things came in. Yep. Um... Are NEPs themselves eligible to apply? Yes. Somebody was just um, joined a little bit late. That's okay. Um, uh, Jim asked that the LOI form will re be released shortly. Yes, Jim, we're hoping to have that out in the coming days um, yep. so that you can submit, but you can see the questions, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, Suzanne, the, the questions of the application are listed in the RFP already, correct? That is correct. So everything, so. yeah. So what's in, if, if you look at the requirements for the LOIs, that is what is going to be requested as part of the form. Great. Um, Annie asks, is there a limit to the number of proposals for which an NEP can provide a letter of support? The number of projects that an NEP can provide a letter of acknowledgement. Yes. Um, so yeah, Canada, no, 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 limit. Yep. no, no, because the only limit we have is the number of um, applications per eligible entity. So, um, you know, if if everybody in Puget Sound really gets fired up about this, then I guess I'll, you know, have to, you know, send a a pot of coffee to the NEP director out there, but, um, <laughs> but no, I mean, there's, there's no, there's no, in other words, we do not have a geographic limit. I think that's maybe probably what the question is too. Like we don't have, we aren't saying, you know, Puget Sound is limited to 10 and Galveston is limited to two or anything like that. So um, yeah, just so long as, as folks um, get those letters, the letters of acknowledgement from the NEPs and you do it early, um, there is no limit. Okay, great. Uh, and Annie, if we didn't answer that correctly, feel free to let us know. Um, yep. uh, a question about the timeline. So all activity, you mentioned that all activities must be completed by September, 2025. Uh, is that the That's end correct. of September or the beginning of September? <laughs> end of September. That's a great okay. question. September, September 30th, 2025. Okay. Um, and Annie says that, that we answered that correctly. So thanks oh, good. Annie for clearing that up. Um, I think that's everything. Um, Rick asked a question, Rick, I will get into this in a second, but, um, I encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Suzanne. I think your question is pretty specific to your project. Um, and we may be able to answer that a little bit better, uh, if we have some more information. All right, so should I move on or do we have more? Um, you can move on and there, every, there are still questions coming in, but we'll catch up, um, okay. I think, in a minute. Yeah, so Rick's question, well, Rick, this, this is for you, I guess. This is a great segue. So um, I realize this is an overview of, of a lot of what's going on. Um, so if you would like to schedule time with me, 
um, please do so. There is a link in the RFP. There's also um, a link off of our 2023 RFP page. Um, what this does is it's a it's it's a great little app. Um, and it means that you can just look at your calendar and it automatically shows what my availability is as well. So ideally, this makes it easier than having to go back and forth saying, what about this time? What about this time? Um, and it's basically updated in real time. So um, I strongly recommend that you um, you take a look at that. Um, and then once you make that appointment, uh, we'll figure out what works for you um, and, and maybe the rest of your team as well, depending on how many people are going to be on. So that can be a Teams meeting like or a Zoom meeting, or it can be a phone call, whatever, whatever works best for you. All right. And then, yeah, so so I, I realized this was a, a lot of information. Um, so please check out the RFP that has all the details. And if there's still something in there that that's not clear, um, um, like I said, send me an email or or use that scheduling um, app to to find time where where we can talk one on one or me with your team, whatever works best for you. So it looks like we had some other questions come in, Rob. Yep, um, and and Charlie proposes a good question here, I think. And uh, Charlie asks if a project crosses an NEP boundary, can these funds be used to fund? part of the project or the part of the project that is inside the boundary, even if there is work being done outside of the boundary? Yes. So, so long as the funded portion falls within these geographic eligibility areas, that's fine. Okay, great. Yep. So, um, like a watershed scale restoration, the, mm -hmm. this money can only be used to fund the work inside the NEP boundary. Even, well, in this, it's like the, it's the yeah the geographic eligibility polygons. It's yes, a little bit. Sorry. That's okay. It's a little bit beyond in some cases, but yeah. So th think of it as you know, as long as the that brown or orange, whatever color you want to call it, um, as it, it can complement other work that's being done, absolutely. Um, but that you have to make sure that that funding um, only goes to the on the ground projects in those eligibility polygons. Great. Um, and Paul is asking if the status of the NEP grant, the other grant, um, the Watersheds grant, is communicated this week. Will rejected submissions be given a rating on your scale or just a yes, no response? I think that's in relation to the other grant. Yeah, yeah. So um, it will be um, a yes, you're invited to submit a full proposal or a, you have been declined. However, um, if folks want, and this is a fairly common request, um, folks will say, oh, I want to, I want to know how I can do better. Um, you know, set, respond to the email. And then um, what I can do is I can provide uh, information um, anonymized and aggregated from the, the review panel. Right. And that I assume that'll be the same process for anyone who uh, receives a um, decline in this application as well. That is correct. correct. Okay. Yep. Great. Uh, that is all I see at the moment. Okay. Well, okay, so on that front, um, oh, did, did something just come in or? Um, Jim, I, I see your question. If if you refer back to the RFP, this is answered uh, in the RFP there as well. So I'm um, asking about when uh, the timeline, uh, if accepted, when the money needs to be spent down. Yep, yep, um, all that's in the RFP. And again, if I, I realize this is a ton of information, so if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, so on that note, I will um, be mindful of everyone's time. So thank you. I And I appreciate your interest in this grant program. And I look forward to reading your submittals. Have a great day, everybody.